Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be in Australia. I have to admit, I decided I was going to come in here and sneak in here quietly and hang out with a few friends and do some collaboration. It's been a little bit of a shock at how warm and welcoming everybody has been. So thank you. Um, I want to give a talk today. Uh, I think one of the big challenges of this audience is some of you are familiar with my work and some of you aren't. I'm going to try to give a talk that goes through one of the core research projects that I've been working on lately um, and leave plenty of room for questions so that we can actually have a fun and open dialogue. Um, one of my passions is to really get at the kind of myths that people have about young people in technology and to do a lot of myth busting. And nowhere is that more palpable than when we talk about issues of privacy. And I'm sure, you know, in Australia, certainly um, like the US, there's this whole kids these days. What are they doing? They don't care about privacy. We need to fix this. So I decided that I would go and try to understand how young people understand privacy and what they do. Um, as Heather kindly uh, noted in, in the opening, I'm an ethnographer. I spend most of my time running around the United States trying to understand everyday practices and coordinating and working with researchers at different levels to try to make sense of how the intersection of technology and society and young people come together. So as we think about teens' practices, one of the things that we've noticed in the last decade is their strong participation in different kinds of social media. And I started a lot of these projects by trying to understand what it was that young people did with social media, how they engaged with it, why it made sense in their lives, and why, you know, in some ways, not much had changed. Um, the technology changed, but the actual attitudes and practices hadn't. And one of the things that I kept coming back to is that regardless of what the current technology is, young people would talk about how participation was absolutely essential to being a part of the social world. And, you know, we can look at these different quotes and say, oh, it was about, you know, MySpace, and this is from a few years ago, Facebook more now. You know, for me, it was about the mall. And I remember my mother loves to remind me, as I used to sit there being like, Mom, I have to go to the mall. If I'm not allowed to go to the mall, I'm not going to be a part of the cool kids. And she's like, tough, right? And we had this long-standing fight about what it meant to do participation. Needless to say, the same has ended up playing out. So I started asking young people about, you know, what would happen if they weren't there. And one of the things you kept hearing was this expectation. And if you're not participating, you have to have a really good reason. And one of the things I love about this quote, for those who can't read it from afar, is that, you know, when, when asked about why not participating, she said, well, it's not like you have to pay for it. So there's not any reason not to be on it. It's pretty much expected you're on Facebook. So there's this assumption that this is a space that is free. And I think there's something really interesting to think about that in light of publicness and privacy. In an environment where young people don't have access to different kind of public spaces, they go to the places where, which appear to them to be free. Now, what do they do there? They hang out. They socialize. They gossip. They joke around. They do all of the things that we had always done. Um, and you ask, you know, why is it particularly interesting? And the kinds of quotes you will say, you know, everyone's on there. You can connect to people across all space for all time that you've been a part of it. I think Falami's quote about, I'm still friends with people from kindergarten, is particularly insightful because of the idea that friendship maintenance becomes a huge part of it. And there's also this sense that you can actually be keeping up with what's going on. That awareness, that presence. And this is driving participation. And it's from this driving participation that we can understand the kinds of practices that play out. So why, you know, what is it that people do? One of the things that I love when I talk to adults about young people's interactions online is that they spend, you know, the assumption that young people spend all this time saying absolutely nothing, right? These conversations that boil down to, yo, what's up? Not much. How you? Good. What you doing? Nothing. Back and forth and back and forth. Of course, you know, I'd argue that you do the same. I'd go just listen to what will happen after this talk is over and the kinds of conversations you have. Um, but what is it that, that, that young people do in terms of participating online doing this? I would argue that they're engaging in an act of social grooming. Right? They're reaching out and they're saying, I like you. I like you too. We are friends. And this is how friendships get formed. And friendships get formed in very social places. These social places are, in many ways, very public places. Some of the kinds of social places we're seeing are indeed social media, again, because this is what they have access to. And you know, one of the things that's fun about coming to Australia is that 
You're probably the only country that tries to compete with the United States on fear-mongering when it comes to young people. Um, so it's like, I don't really have to echo this, but one of the things that you know, we found in the US, and it's certainly also true in the UK, is that young people's right to roam has been radically decreased over three generations. So what you see is that young people who previously, in previous generations, might have you know, gotten on a bike and gone far out and as far as they could go to hang out with their friends, today are very much constrained very locally into their house. And many of the young people that I talk to, they don't, their parents don't want them to be out of their sight. Right? And so what you see is that the internet becomes a place to do this social grooming, when in fact this social grooming is something that we've seen face to face with young people forever. Now, of course, that means that there's a byproduct of it, right? We have a record of this. And this is where you start to see comments like the um, one from Alana about how it becomes a scrapbook of your life. This is a way in which all of this material, all of these ways of, of presenting and socializing become recorded. Um, and this is, mind you, before the idea of a timeline um, on Facebook, but this idea of having this long history of what goes on. Again, this isn't something that's particularly new. We just think of it as much more private. Um, and if you think about the history of studying bedroom culture um, and the scholarship around bedroom culture with young people, what you see is this long-standing history of how you understand yourself and participating in broader media ecologies. The idea of taking this media bringing it in part of your environment and showcasing who you are. It's just that your ability to show off the bedroom culture and to have that as your scrapbook that was really social wasn't necessarily available for. And this is where we get into the question of network publics. Network publics, um, painfully academic term, but yet super valuable, uh, because in some ways it's a way of understanding how the network technologies have allowed us to recreate or re-understand a public space. Now, publics themselves are you know, environments where people come together. There are ideas of shared audiences. There's all sorts of historical understandings of this from the Habermasian approach to the Warner approach. And I'm kind of loading in all of this. And if you don't know who those are, that's totally OK. But the way that I like to think of network publics is the idea that they are publics that are restructured by network technologies. They are simultaneously a space constructed through those network technologies and the imagined community of people that emerge as a result of the intersection of people, technology, and practice. Right? And you can experience this. You understand this as a public space. And it's important to realize that this is a public space that is not all people across all space and all time, but a sense of an environment where you feel like you're in some sort of public, but it has boundaries all the same. Now, these publics are similar to and different than the kinds of publics that we have always understood. And I would argue that most publics are becoming networked. But I think it's important to recognize the kinds of shifts that have taken place as a result of these network technologies. And in particular, I'm going to talk about four of the key properties that I think are really interesting to think about, as well as some dynamics that play out. And again, we'll use this to get into the idea of privacy. First, what you say online sticks around for a very long time. This is the notion of persistence. This means that the stupid things you said when you were 13 on Usenet are still there. right? And it's this idea of persistence and the ability to have these records of what you said and how you interact that feels fundamentally different than the kinds of publics that we're used to in an unmediated environment. Um, Mixed with that is the idea of replicability. One of the things about how internet architecture works is that it literally copies the content as it shares it across the network. This means that a lot of material is copied and shared. But it also is that there's a technical affordance to copy and paste things. What's challenging online is that these interactions make it hard to differentiate the original from the duplicate. And this means that you can copy and paste things, and you don't know if it was modified or not. You don't know what the original was. And this changes the kinds of dynamic. This, by the way, we get into issues of bullying, which we can talk about in Q&A if you want to. Um, but it's the idea that this copy and paste becomes part of the dynamic. A third key affordance from this has to do with searchability. My mother would have loved the ability to just stand in a room and scream, find, and figure out where I was with my friends. She couldn't, for which I am deeply, deeply grateful. She still can't, still appreciative. Um, but for young people who are participating in a very social environment and a network public, they become extraordinarily searchable. And they're not just searchable by anybody. They're searchable by the people who hold power over them. It is the people who want to look for them because of that position of power that engage in those searches. So it's the college admissions officer. It's the, it's the boss. It's the people who are going to use that search to really look in on people. Again, this is so quite different from the kinds of publics we're used to. Oops. The fourth affordance has to do with scalability. 
Now, the weird thing about the internet is that in theory, you can reach millions and millions and millions of people. The irony of this is that the average blog, the last time that this the study was done, which was a couple of years ago now, the average blog was read by six people. Okay? Now, if you think about that, if you think about average and you think about really big blogs, that means the vast majority of them are read by no one. So the idea is that even though you can scale to huge audiences, doesn't mean that you're actually going to generate huge audiences. And for every Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber out there, there are tons of people who have no followers whatsoever. So scale is a really tricky thing in an online environment because we fear the scale, the magnificence, the millions, when in fact most people don't have that experience of high publicity. Now, things change because what tends to be most scalable, therefore what tends to be most spreadable, is that which is humiliating, grotesque, sexual, or otherwise embarrassing. Right? So it's not just that anything scales, as most politicians have learned, but the things that will make them look like fools. Right? And we see this with young people as they're trying to grapple with it. So here you have these four key affordances that really disrupt our understandings of how to interact in public environments. And the under our understandings of boundaries, our understandings of scope and scale, our relationship to these environments. So part of it is that we start to have to deal with entirely new dynamics. And so I'm going to talk about three of the kinds of dynamics that I um, have had a field day with over the years, and then we'll dive into one more deeply. The first is the idea of invisible audiences. Right? Now, I'm in this room. It's RMIT. I'm talking to you. You've come to hear me talk, and I understand something about you. I hope you speak English or this makes absolutely no sense. I have a feeling of whether or not you're following me because you're either nodding or along or pretending to nod along and, and look like you're entertained. But there's also cameras there, and I think there's another one there. And I have no idea who's at the other end of that audience. Right? I don't know if they speak English. I don't know if they're consuming this in 2012 or if they're consuming this in 2030. I have no understanding of who that audience is. So my understanding of how to interact, my understanding of what it means to convey information, I'm entirely directed at you and your reactions to me and some combination of who I imagine you to be, which may or may not be accurate um, and probably isn't, and that's what we roll with, right? This is idea of how do we navigate audiences. Now, the reason that this matters is that all of the ways we interact with people are in order to put on a, you know, a, a sense of self, in order to do some form of impression management. And that requires understanding the audience. So when we see these participations in network publics, the issues about our audience become tricky, um, and people are really struggling with it. Connected to that is the idea of collapsed contexts. Right? We're very used to having distinct contexts in which we define what is appropriate, an appropriate behavior in a particular environment. For example, this is a lecture hall, which means you're supposed to sit there and not talk. We can kind of whisper to the side, but you're supposed to sit there and face me. In theory, any one of you could suddenly get onto your chair and start dancing and singing and hollering and hooting. I'd find it entertaining. It would be totally inappropriate to this environment. That doesn't mean it would be inappropriate to these people. If we're all out at a pub later tonight, you can totally do that and it would be appropriate. So our understandings of context have to do with both the space environment and with the people. Well, what happens in an online environment is that context becomes really blurred really fast. And it's really hard to understand what the boundaries and norms are. Now, young people particularly struggle with this because they're trying to make sense of context generally. And this is part of the socialization process. This, by the way, does not magically stop when you're 18. It's an ongoing process. And as an adult, if you shift context tremendously, you deal with this all the time, is that for young people, there's a lot less exposure, so there's a lot more experimentation and making sense of it. But they're regularly having to deal with collapsed contexts. They're regularly having to deal with an environment that is simultaneously being derived by the idea of peer norms, what is cool amongst your friends, and what is appropriate amongst adults, and the norms of adults regulating behavior. The third um, key uh, dynamic that comes into all of this is the idea of blurring of public and private. Again, it's very connected to the other two. Our understandings of public and private are based on our understandings of how, um, what the boundaries are, our understandings of context, our understandings on how far information will flow, our understanding what the so social norms and expectations are. And I would argue that our understanding of privacy requires two really key things that come back to understanding uh, the kinds of dynamics that play out. First, it requires a sense of agency. It requires the ability to actually make a decision and be able to assert that decision in that environment. And the second is the ability to control the social situation. 
right? And these two blend together in really complicated ways online, which is what we'll dive deep into, which is what happens when your ability to have agency in that environment is undermined by your parent sitting over your shoulder, or is undermined by the idea that Facebook changes its privacy settings every other day, or is undermined by the you know, technical architecture where something can be copied and pasted and shared. And how do you then control a social situation? Most of our understandings of control, we come back to technology. You should control it by having privacy settings and making it exact about what kind of control happens. And yet this is not how we control privacy or control social situation with regard to privacy writ large. More often than not, we have ideas of trust. And again, this will come back into privacy. So I want to sort of think about where some of this plays out, these architectural shifts, and start by highlighting a, a quote by Alicia, where I think this is really, this highlights the challenges of how young people recognize that there's a shift underway, and they're not always sure of what it means. And she highlights that, I just think technology is redefining what's acceptable for people to put out about themselves. I've grown up with technology, so I don't know how it was like before this boom of social networking. But it just seems like instead of spending all of our time talking to individual people and sharing things that would seem private, we spend all of our time putting it in one module of communication where people can go and access it if they want to. What she's highlighting here is a shift, a shift around how information is shared and the idea of who gathers it. And this comes back to the architectural issue that we sort of mapped out before with network publics. But the way to think about it is, I would argue, a shift around defaults. If we were having a conversation, a personal conversation, even out in the hallway where people could overhear, our interaction would be private by default, public through effort. It would be private by default because it's really kind of hard to share it with a lot more people. It would be public with effort because you make a decision about what to share, what to publicize. You know, we can call it hearsay, but it's also a way in which information gets chosen of what to scale or what not to. In an online environment, things are actually public by default, private through effort. And it's this switch that is the result of why we see young people appearing to have given up privacy. Because it is easier to share online, to, to share everything online, than it is to actually choose what to share. So take it more concretely. One of the things when you watch young people taking photos, they'll dump and put all of their photos up online and then choose what to remove, rather than curating ahead of time and choosing what to share. Likewise, the idea of sharing with the whole group of friends makes a lot more sense. You say, who cares if somebody reads what I had for breakfast? Well, I don't care. If, if it's relevant to a, some of my friends, I might as well share it generally, and they can filter it out. Right? And it's the idea of expecting other people to filter rather than me choosing what not to share that makes sense. And now that doesn't mean that there aren't things that are, that are kept quiet. And in fact, it's that decision when they choose about why not to share something where things get really, really interesting. Part of this is to realize that as we understand these issues of privacy in a public space, we have to realize that what young people do when they come to, a so to social media is that it's not that they want to participate um, or it's not that they want to be public. It's not that they want to be seen by everybody. It's they want to participate in a public. They're there in order to socialize. They're there in order to connect. They're there in order to build relationships and to do all of the things that we do when we're in a social setting. And so a choice of privacy becomes a choice of privacy in a public environment, which surprisingly we do all the time. We do it when we're hanging out in social environments. You do it when you're in the pub is that what young people are doing in an online environment is playing out that way. Now, like adults, young people have very huge confusion about what constitutes privacy. And there's no really clean definition of privacy. And so I'll highlight the fact that when you actually try to ask young people about what privacy means to them, they have a bazillion and one definitions. But a lot of it comes down to respect, the idea of being able to keep things private. They use a lot of the same rhetoric. Um, as adults, which makes it seem like it's similar, but yet it also really shows some of the confusion in it. It's also important to realize that there's a huge variety in terms of how young people engage in public environments. There are exhibitionists. There are exhibitionists among adults. This is not new. Um, it's just that not all young people are engaged in different kinds of exhibitionism. Furthermore, some of their acts of very publicness, their willingness to be seen by everybody, are often more messy than you might think. And I'm going to use a quote from Mei Jing, who I think is really fantastic. And she, she describes herself as a very um, extroverted person who shares by default. And you know, one of the things I asked her is, so you don't care about privacy. She's like, I do care about privacy. But if I found somebody that I could trust, my first instinct would be to share with that person. 
And it's the idea of sharing, and she talks about um, her boyfriend, and I'll come back to this in a second. She's talking about that sharing is a way of closeness. What's interesting is that her idea of sharing is far beyond the idea of what's acceptable among many adults. And she points out that she and her boyfriend actually share passwords with one another. Um, this, again, may be shocking. One of the things I was super grateful to Pew Internet and American Life Project, who ran surveys on this in the United States and found that um, uh, over a third of young people actually share uh, their passwords. And if you look at um, the oldest groups of it, the high school age, it's, over, it's about half of them share. Um, so, oops. So I was like, you know, well, why is it that you're sharing? And she says, well, it makes me feel safer, right? And there's someone there to help me out. And it uh, feels, you know, Facebook sometimes feels like a lonely kind of sport. Now, here's something that there's a couple of different signals to read in all of this. And by the way, she says, you know, if someone else knows your password, it just feels better. One, it's important to realize that she brings out the notion of safety. This is actually something that came from adults. One of the things that adults gave in the rhetorics around safety was they told their kids that you have to share your password with me because I'm going to protect you. Right? And this became a dominant rhetoric of online safety. And what it got reinforced with is like, don't you trust me? I, I, you can trust me. I'm your mother. Right? The funny thing is, is that there's been a translation of that attitude, a translation that in order to trust somebody, in order to feel connected to someone, in order to feel safe, this is a perfectly reasonable outcome. Right? So this idea of password sharing wasn't actually generated by young people entirely. It was mostly generated by adults. Um, and you hear it over and over again amongst young people who talk about sharing, sharing passwords, is that it became the norm in their household, and it was a marker of trust. Of course, there's a history of this, and anybody who was, you know, had a school locker combination, you shared your combo with people. You shared it for various reasons. One, so somebody could pick up your homework at the end of the day when you forgot it. Um, you shared it so that maybe somebody would leave you a fun note in the middle of the day and you really wanted that. Um, and you shared it because it was a way of actually signaling trust. All of these have come into play in terms of what's going on online. So we look at this moment, we look at this idea of a violation of privacy, when in fact it can be completely explained by a whole set of cultural forces. Cultural forces around trust, around safety, around what it means to actually feel connected to somebody. Now, that doesn't mean that all young people are engaging in this, th that level of sharing. Um, and part of what I think is really interesting is, you know, the ways in which people will articulate that there's certain things that are to be shared and th certain things that aren't. And their boundaries may be different than adults, but part of it is, you know, really valuable as they work it out. And Abigail points that, you know, um, they don't need to know exactly what I'm doing today. You know, I'm eating breakfast, going to swim practice, doing my history homework, doing this. She's like, no, no, no. They c I can just say sort of overview. Right? So this is how she, she's chosen to do this. But what's important to realize is that it's just choice. It's a process. It's trying to actually make sense of things. And it's that process of building norms that becomes really important to understanding how privacy gets navigated. Now, mixed in this is a, a very implicit, if not explicit, idea of who belongs and who doesn't. And young people will go out of their way to talk about who is appropriate and who's not. You will hear these great quotes like, Facebook is for my friends, not for my mom. I wouldn't go to my teacher's page and look at their stuff, so why should they look at mine? These kinds of comments highlight something really important. Just because it's publicly accessible doesn't mean it was meant for you. And I think this is one of the really hard tricks um, in understanding how privacy gets navigated because there's an understanding of where boundaries work that are not about the technology. And yet we have this feeling that just because we can see it, we should. Um, and it's that conflict that results in a lot of frustration among young people and adults about what goes on here. So with that in mind, understanding that they recognize privacy, understanding that they're dealing with this kind of conflicting different architecture, one of the things I think is interesting is how they try to find innovative strategies to deal with privacy in network publics. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different privacy strategies that young people have done. And they're really trying to f be innovative to make sense of things. And in that process, they show some of the difficulties that they face. I'll start with Hunter. Um, Hunter was a, a, by the way, one of the things that's really funny to me is that these pictures are as close approximate of um, uh, pictures as I could possibly find to the young people I interview without actually giving away their um, identities. And this is really frustrating because Hunter is not this clean cut. Hunter's, the, a better picture of Hunter, Hunter, which I've never found a good image online, is of um, Steve Urkel. He literally had broken glasses when I met him. So picture this young boy um, who's living in an um, urban region in, in Washington, D.C. Um, he is uh, an American citizen. None of the rest of his family is documented. Um, so there's a lot of political dynamics of what he, it means for him to be there. Um, his 
he very much values school and education as the thing that's most important to him. He's managed to get himself into uh, a charter school, uh, which is actually a pretty powerful move. Um, it's a very sort of ed um, academically focused charter school, which most of the rest of his family think is absolutely ridiculous, um, and why he's spending all of his time doing this book learning. Um, and he's constantly fighting with his family, who he describes as, quote, unquote, ghetto. And one of the things that he struggles with is how to navigate, again, collapsed context and how to deal with it. And so, you know, he highlights this in this story where he says, I'm talking to my friends on Facebook, I put up a status, and something I hate is when people who I'm not addressing in my statuses comment on them. In my old school, people used to call me nerdy and say that I was the least black black person that they've ever met. Some people say that, and I said on Facebook, should I take offense to the fact that someone put their ringtone white and nerdy as for me? And it was a joke. And we were all talking about it in school, and my sister comes out of nowhere, and she's like, oh, baby bro. And I'm like, don't say that. I wasn't talking to you. And here's this moment where Hunter is like, look, there's an understanding of what the rules are. And so I poked him, I pushed him on this and said, you know, how do you actually understand this? And he's like, I guess that's the point. It's really hard, but I think there's a certain way that you talk. I will talk to my sister in a different way than I talk to my friends at school. He's trying to assert social norms in an environment where we'd normally do this face to face and we would have an understanding of boundaries. But he really struggles with this. He's not found a way to actually manage his sister simultaneously to his, um, to his friends at school. And he's constantly dealing with this, this collapse. So one of the ways when he, when social norms failed, when his ability to try to say, like, don't you understand the boundaries failed, he went to actually start using technological means. And this is actually where it's interesting to understand how privacy settings work. Hunter chose to use privacy settings not because he didn't want people to read his material, but because he wanted to start segmenting his audiences so that they could actually comment in ways that were reasonable. And this particularly came up um, when, so Hunter is really obsessed with Pokemon um, and Legends of Zelda and all sorts of um, uh, different kinds of 1980s geek culture, which he thinks is um, as retro, which is a little depressing on my end. Um, <laughs> but the really, he's really interested in the retro games, um, and his cousins and his siblings, on the other hand, are really, really interested in um, first-person shooters um, and violent video games. And so he found that whenever he would talk about Legends of Zelda on Facebook, his cousins would come in and be like, that's so lame. Um, that was probably the nicest way of putting it. Usually ev devolved into that's so gay, which was a whole separate level of issues. And it would create these fights. And so he found himself creating these different lists where he would use um, he would talk about Legends of Zelda and make it only available to the other people who he knew would appreciate the geeky references. And then he would go and perform his participation in shooter games and make it only available to his family. And they didn't realize who was available to what, and they would comment accordingly, and he was like, phew. Until, of course, Facebook changed a few settings, and he was dealing with a whole separate level of nightmare. But it's this attempt to use structural um, settings in order to deal with uh, a social norm situation. So... Part of it is I started saying, well, what are the most innovative and radical ideas of using structural settings, using the features that exist there? And I found um, two examples that I'm going to highlight that I think are really phenomenal. And these, by the way, I'm not saying that these are normative. These are not broad. These are just little case studies that I think highlight some of the innovations. Um, one of the first ones is a, a woman named Shamika. And one of the things she found is that everything that would happen um, on Facebook would result in different kinds of drama. And in particular, things that she had forgotten about that were written like six months ago, people would bring back up and use again. And so she decided that she needed to get rid of the past just so people stopped obsessing and misreading the past. And she engaged in a practice that she called white walling. And the idea of white walling was that she would log into Facebook every day, and when she read a comment that somebody left on her page, she would then delete it. She would go and she would leave comments on other people's pages, and other, you know, on their photos, all those other things. And then the next day, she would log in and she would delete those. She would leave enough time for people to read it, enough time for people to comment, and then she would keep cleaning. And she was on a constant purging process. She cleansed her Facebook in order to reduce drama. And I asked her, you know, well, technically anybody could actually just copy and paste that and save it. She's like, yeah, but that would make you a real creep, right? And so she understood that the social norms of creepiness would, would override the sort of workaround. She knew that the site, the material was still stored. She knew it was still available on servers. She wasn't worried about that. She just wanted to make it really hard to get back to the past, okay? Another sort of radical strategy um, came from Michaela. And Michaela, um, low-income uh, woman who is in foster care and is constantly dealing with dynamics of how the state is looking f um, over her shoulders. And she decided that um, 
she would leverage a particular feature in Facebook where, I don't know if any of you have actually tried to delete your account, but when you try to delete your account in Facebook, it goes to the thing, well, you don't really want to leave, do you? Why don't you just deactivate your account? And if you deactivate your account the next day and you, you, you have a regret, you can log back in and get everything back. And she decided that this was very useful. So every day she would log into Facebook, she would hang out with people real time, she would chat, she would go back and forth, and when she was done, she would deactivate her account. And then the next day, she would log back in, she would reactivate her account, and it would start over. And I said, you know, okay, so you can, you know, she basically turned this into a real-time activity. And I said, well, you know, when you're logged in, people can still look at it. She was like, oh, well, it's really clear. Adults only look at this during the day, and, you know, kids only look at this at night. So I'm only logged in at night, right? And I was like, okay, that works. Right? And in her head, this is a way of structurally achieving some sort of boundary work that she was desperate to get um, and that she couldn't use the technology to get there. Now, those are structural strategies, but some of the most interesting to me are the much more social strategies for working around this. So Carmen um, is another teenager who I spent a lot of time with who's just delightful. Um, and she found that she had all these dynamics you know, on Facebook because she's brought all of these different worlds together. Um, her family's from Argentina. She's really excited. They come onto Facebook. They speak in Spanish. And that creates a certain separation from her friends who mostly speak in English. And she goes back and forth. But then there's her mother. And her mother is a sort of source of frustration. She loves her mother. They are very, very, very close. But one of the things she complains about is her mother tends to overreact to everything. And so, you know, and your mother loves to comment on everything. So she's like, okay, how do you deal with mom? And I said, well, you know, why don't you delete her comments? And said, you know, you can't do that. And I said, well, why don't you like her being there? And she's like, well, it scares everyone away. Everyone kind of disappears after the mom post. Right? And so she's dealing with this challenge of how to deal with the mom post. And the mom post becomes this really difficult thing. So one day, um, Carmen is sort of having a really crappy day. She and her boyfriend have just broken up. She wants to sort of tell all of her friends um, about what was going on and the fact she felt really, really emo. And she wasn't happy, and she wanted to find a way to express that. And the best way to express all of these things, as always, is through song lyrics. Song lyrics are the answer to all emotional expression if you're under the age of 18. And so she was thinking about putting up some sappy song lyrics, but she knew that her mother would overreact and think she was suicidal. This had happened before, right? One sad thing and, like, the world fell apart. So she was thinking about how could she convey to her friends the fact that she was feeling really crappy without making her mother panic. And she came up with an idea. She and her friends had recently seen a movie, so she decided to put up song lyrics from that movie. And that movie was the Monty Python, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. Now, for those of you who have not seen The Life of Brian, you should know that these, this song is sung in the most chipper of ways, you know, always look on the bright side of life, during a scene in which the key character is being um, killed, right? Is being, is being um, executed. So, you know, it, it's this really interesting juxtaposition. Needless to say, she puts this song lyric up. She knows her mother doesn't get this British reference. Um, and she puts this up, and her mother immediately writes, oh, it looks like you're having a great day. <laughs> and her friends immediately call her. Right? And it's about that ability to work around and engage in a practice of, of navigating this by hiding in plain sight. One of the ways that I like to think of what Carmen is doing is through the ideas of social steganography. And steganography is an old um, crypto term, which is the idea of hiding in plain sight. It has actually a pretty sordid history. You can kind of think of um, uh, Greek slaves who had things tattooed in their heads, let their hair grow out, and then were sent off to make the message known. more polite version would have been wax tablets. But the idea is that you had to actually know what to look for. You had to know that there was meaning hidden in there. And you otherwise, it was the content was accessible. And indeed, that's what is the dominant privacy strategy for young people. They make their content publicly accessible, but the meaning isn't publicly accessible. And it's the idea that the meaning becomes the thing that is encoded that is the powerful way of actually achieving privacy in a very public environment. This is something that we've seen age old, right? This is one of the techniques that you've seen, um, you see in terms of political dissidents. It's one of the most dominant um, uh, ta tactics used by any oppressed population, which should ask us about what it is that young people are doing, right? How are they responding to this? Um, now, this doesn't mean that those, that those acts of visibility or those acts of um, hiding in plain sight don't have complications to them. And one of the things that plays out with young people is that there are times where they will also make encoding a way of really performing who's in and who's out, a way of, of 
excluding and doing in-jokes, a way of letting people know what's going on. And this, mind you, is how we get into some sort of nasty drama-like behavior. My favorite example of this is that I was sitting with a 17-year-old girl named Serena in North Carolina. We were going through her Facebook. I want to, oh, by the way, one of the things I've learned in this, in this process is that I, even if I have access, um, access to Facebook and MySpace and Tumblr and Twitter, most of the time I have no clue what young people are saying. It's very much encoded, and even though I've spent a lot of time with young people, I don't always know the meaning. So one of the main reasons that I love interviewing and sitting down with young people is that they tell me these things, and I'm like, wow, I would never have read that that way. So I was sitting with a girl named Serena, we come across a series of um, Facebook statuses. And the first one is like sort of, I'm you know, sick and tired of all of this. And it was liked by 32 people. And it was followed up a few minutes later, and there's another one t seemingly disconnected that says, she's such a bitch. And it was liked by 50 people. And so I started asking, I'm like, what is this? Oh, oh, this was drama, right? And here's this girl, and they're fighting over this, and here's the boy, and da 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 And she knew exactly what these messages were. She knew all of the pronouns. She knew all of what was going on in this. Later on that day, I happened to be uh, with one of the, um, an educator in the community and sort of asked, you know, you, you're friends with all these people on Facebook. She's like, oh, yeah, yeah. So we were looking at her Facebook. Sure enough, these same messages were available on her Facebook. She's like, yeah, I don't really know what it means. And I was just like, right, very successful strategy. It's a way of actually letting people know who's in and who's out. And sometimes it's performed in order to be seen and it'd be very visible and sometimes not. Skip ahead. So one of the things about this is that we start to see these kinds of dramatic actions. And I think that, you know, again, we can get into this more in the Q&A since it's sort of a separate topic. But one of the things that I've been dealing with as I start to try to understand bullying, which is, by the way, a very adult-driven term, is to actually understand instead what young people see as drama. And one of the things that's powerful about how they see drama is that drama ranges from the teasing and the joking around to the true harassment. And it's that range of possibilities, it's that range of emotional dynamics that allows there to be an emotional distancing of what goes on. And sure enough, amidst all of the things that are a way of achieving privacy and a way of actually doing exclusion are the ways in which these things get worked out. All right, so in, I'm going to conclude this uh, shortly so that we can actually get into some Q&A. But one of the things I want to sort of final, finalize with is an understanding of what's going on in terms of visibility. If you look at the kinds of um, environments that young people are interacting with, there's an increased ability to see into the lives of young people. This, by the way, tends to result in adults flipping out. You know, adults are absolutely convinced because they see these kinds of dramas, they see the kinds of you know, sharing and information, that they think these radical things, you know, their kids have been abducted by aliens, terrible things are happening, et cetera, et cetera. But what's happening is that young people in many ways are trying to participate in the public environments that they have access to. And I think a better model for thinking about what's going on here is the flaneur. And for those who you know, sort of know the history of Baudelaire's work, he, talked, he was really enamored um, with Parisian society. And he talked a lot about um, the flaneur, which is the idea of individuals who came to the street to see and be seen. They were neither exhibitionists, nor were they voyeurs, but you could understand them through both lenses. They were very much participating in order to get something back, in order to actually be able to observe. It was that interplay between seeing and being seen that became so powerful. And as you see young people trying to embrace these online environments, in many ways they're engaging in practices that are akin to a digital flaneurship. They're going out there and they're seeing, they're, they're looking and they're watching and they're trying to make sense of and they're sharing in order to be seen. Because one of the things about social media is that you're rendered invisible unless you share. You, you don't show up on people's timelines. You don't show up on their news feeds. You're not there unless you participate. And it's that process of expected participation, the ability to write yourself into a um, digital environment in order to be a part of the ecosystem that promote, prompts people, prompts young people to really participate and share and be present. But the challenge is, is that as they're doing this, they're being looked upon by a whole set of people. And again, power becomes really important here. They're looked upon by adults who are trying to make sense of what's going on, and they argue about the dynamics that are happening there. And young people are really trying to actually understand this environment. They're trying to actually understand society more generally. And they're doing it in a constantly shifting um, technological landscape with an environment where they're learning to expect surveillance. So all of their understandings of privacy, how they're learning privacy, are, is in the context of surveillance. It's in the context of adults, their parents, their teachers, their government, looking over their shoulder. 
It's the expectation that they don't have the kinds of privacy that you ha um, uh, understand about the home, about the physical space that can be separated, and instead they're trying to carve out privacy in this environment. So the value still holds. The value of privacy is still extraordinarily important to young people. It's just that what they're trying to do to achieve it is really make sense of all of the ecosystems that we see, all of the environments. And so, you know, as we think about that, I think it's about important to move from the idea that they're trying to be public and understand that they're trying to be in a public. And that those publics are shifting. Those are very networked publics. And it's a really fundamentally new set of dynamics that unfold. But the reasons and the motivations um, and why kids are doing what they're doing completely makes sense in this environment. Thank you very much.